So I got a knock on the door and I thought, oh, heck, I'll go, I'll go to the door. And it was our neighbour from downstairs. She, she's not here anymore. And she's like, you have got to stop singing. <laughs> I cannot take it anymore. <laughs> you know, she's at the end of her tether. Yeah. Like if for her to be in, at your door knocking, she's like, this, just stop. Just stop. <laughs> It's the Germany Experience, the podcast about life in Germany as seen through the eyes of outsiders. I'm your host, Sean, and visit thegermanyexperience.de to subscribe to the podcast, listen to past episodes, contact me, and more. So, yeah, here we are. Coronavirus is out of control again. And this time, this time, it seems to be a lot worse. And it's, I, I, I tell you, it, it is hard not to let this get you down. Uh, I guess we've been under the impression that Germany had this under control the whole time while other countries had it spiraling out of control. But I guess we didn't quite, did we? We maybe delayed this a little. And it's such a difficult situation that we have right now. Like, do we shut down everything again until the numbers get under control? Or do we take some measures and not go fully into lockdown? I don't know. I don't know what to say. Essentially, what governments have to do right now is make a decision about protecting the vulnerable versus protecting the economy and the livelihoods of so many people. It's, it's like a thought experiment, but this is real. This is the decisions that they're facing. And yeah, that's, it's not so easy, is it, to decide one or the other? Because either way, either thing that you choose, you're kind of stuck between a rock and a hard place. And I guess it just comes down to what your political philosophies say. So if your philosophies say that you're going to protect the vulnerable, then I guess that's the side that you're going to go on. And if if it's more about protecting the economy and keeping uh, small businesses afloat and keeping keeping things going, then that's what you decide. So it's very interesting. On Spiegel.de, they covered a survey that was done on the ZDF Politbarometer. And there, 30% of the people who were surveyed think that the current measures that Germany has in place are not strict enough. So that's a third of people are saying that it's not strict enough. 54% think that the current measures as they are right now are exactly right. And keep in mind, this survey was done with the numbers already spiraling out of control. So this is a very current look at uh, at what, what's happening. And so 54% think it's okay what we're doing right now. And by the way, this is where I fall. I don't know where you fall, but I fall in this 54% where I think, okay, these current measures are right. There's a bit of inconsistencies. There are some things that don't make sense about how we got. But in general, I think we're doing the right things. We have the right measures in place. It's. I feel like we're walking a good line between preventing the spread of this disease. Well, maybe not because the numbers are spiraling out. But I feel like there's not much more we can do. We're We're walking this line where we're preventing the spread and the other side of the line is just stopping everything. So we're kind of trying to have the best of both worlds where we're trying to prevent the spread, but still keep everything going. Uh, I think it's a tricky thing to do. I don't know how else we would do it. I don't want to see full lockdowns at this point. I really don't. I just think that there's, there's people who are right at the limit right now and another lockdown would just break them. It would just break them. So I, I I don't, it's, it. It's uh, very difficult. But I do think the idea of local lockdowns, by the way, are, is a good idea. I think that's like if you have a break, a, a, an outbreak in a specific area, then it makes sense to take very, very strict measures. And that's exactly what the government is doing. So like I said, I'm in this 54% that think the current measures are getting it right. 14% think the current measures are too much. But, and this is the statistic that I like, 87% see Maskenpflicht or the obligation to wear a mask as necessary. 87%. So don't let these protests sway you to thinking that there's a growing mass of people that don't want to wear masks anymore. 87% are being logical and thinking about this. And, and, and I think, you know what, when it comes to masks, I think it's the least of the problems. Like I, if you told me tomorrow that the schools and kindergartens would be closing down, I would not be pleased about that. I would be like, is can we not just work through this or something? But wearing a mask, I just put a piece of cloth on my face and that's it. It's nothing. I, I know there are some people who have medical conditions, but those people are really the minority of people. Wearing a mask is minimum effort for a big result. So I don't 
I, I don't see the point of all these protests. Uh, but that's not why we're here, is it? No, we're here to hear stories of life in Germany. And that's what we're going to do. And my guest this week is Fiona. And she comes from the United Kingdom. She and her husband are opera singers. And they moved here to Germany to work as opera singers. In our discussion, we cover how they're integrated into Germany by sending their daughter to something called a Kinderladen. And we get into what that is and how it can help with integration. How she learned about the Mittagsruhe period in Germany. There's a period in the afternoons where you're not supposed to make any sounds. <laughs> she learned the hard way about the Mittagsruhe period. And we talk about how Brexit has affected their lives. Now, just a note, we recorded this interview face-to-face -face a few weeks ago when the coronavirus numbers were still pretty low and under control. There was uh, a lot of more of a relaxed feeling. And I went over to Fiona and we did the interview there together face-to-face. But this isn't something I would do at the present time, just to be clear, because the numbers currently are spiraling out of control and a face-to-face -face interview right now, at this point in time, would be out of the question, completely out of the question. With all that said, here is Fiona from the United Kingdom. So I'm sitting here with Fiona from the UK. Yeah. Yes. Hi. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> So uh, we'll get to where you're from and your background and how you got to Germany. But I'm gonna say this is one of the first one to one of the first face to face interviews that I've done since the whole coronavirus thing. Because obviously I've switched over to doing everything online, but now uh, I decided today we would do it face to face because it's always better. And you live in the Nuremberg area, so I just figured, hey, let's let's do it face to face. But getting here, Fiona, <laughs> reminds me why I've chosen not to leave the house <laughs> recently. <laughs> So getting to you from getting to you from where I am is quite a drive, like over 45 kilometers. I think actually 50 kilometers. I'm not sure. And then you told me before I came that you have a bit of a parking problem here. And another 50 kilometers to park. Yeah, it was like another, it was maybe the same amount of time circling the block trying to find a parking here. It's pretty crazy, the situation you guys have it here. Is, it is unbelievable. It's bad on normal days but at the moment we we have this huge Baustelle this huge building site across the road from us and at the same time they've decided that they're going to renew the tram lines okay which is why we have this whole street down yeah. there without any parking no <laughs> lost a little so everyone's kind of crammed down the side streets because usually what I can do is just drive some, drive a few side streets and eventually I find something. Yeah. But I actually literally started thinking Nothing. I'm never finding anything <laughs> and this interview is not going to happen. Um, but here I am eventually found yeah. a parking uh yeah so thank you very much for having me we had to do this kind of like social distancing and uh wearing a mask and all the rest of it. obviously we're not wearing a mask now during the interview yeah but uh <laughs> yeah it is a pandemic after all but i far prefer doing face-to-face -face interviews because it's just a completely different it's more fun for me it's uh it's just a whole different ball game yeah so fiona that's an interesting oh by the way before we can before we go into that you Aren't, this is not your first time on the podcast. It's not. No. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you were on the, po the the podcast episode about the park run because you were involved in the park run. Yeah. Yeah. It's over a year ago now, I think, yeah, isn't it? It's yeah. It's only like a year ago. Yeah. Um, so I was one of the um, three people that did the podcast. Uh, we had a good laugh then. <laughs> yeah, it was fun, wasn't <laughs> it? Was it? Fun. Yeah. It was fun. Yeah. Yeah. And you, t I think something that you told me is that you weren't a podcast listener before the whole discussion that we had. No, I wasn't at all. Okay. Um, You're welcome, Fiona. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I always like it that my podcast is the first podcast people find because then it's not like you're fettered by any great quality that you've heard before. You just hear mine, you're like, oh, this is pretty good <laughs> because you have no frame of reference. But it is really good. And uh -huh. honestly, it's been super for me because. I think you can kind of, you can sometimes feel really lonely being in Germany. Yeah. You've made this move over here and you feel like you're a bit of a strange person. Yeah. And then to know that there's other people that are going through this as well at the same time as you are <laughs> and that your story is not just the only crazy story that you've got. <laughs> yeah. And I actually, I actually get that a lot from people who listen to the podcast because they say, oh, I, did, I didn't realize people are actually feeling the same. It's not just me mm -hmm. that's feeling the same way. And people have a, obviously feel... A, there's a lot of different ways that people can feel, obviously, but it's just, uh, it's nice when you hear those stories or aspects of people's stories that you can relate to. Yeah. 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 Cool. Well, I'm glad you found the podcast and here we are because we said we, I have to get you back on to talk about your story. Um, so maybe 
tell me your background. Like, where are so you from? I'm from the northwest of England, mm-hmm. um, Preston, which is a yeah, it's a it's a relatively big town, just a bit north of Manchester, not far from, far from the coast. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I lived there until I went to university. Moved around in Britain quite a bit. Lived in Birmingham and in Glasgow and Manchester. Uh, that's how it is when you're a musician, really, I guess. <laughs> yeah, that's the other part of your story that we're going to get to. <laughs> Move around quite a lot um, until we moved out here in Germany, and we've been here since 2013. Mm -hmm. So you moved around within the UK? Yeah. And then from the UK to Germany? To Germany. Okay, and when when you say we? That's me and my husband and my daughter. Okay, so you were already married in the UK? Yeah, we were. Okay. Yeah. And you, so so you said the reason for the move was being a musician? Yeah. So how does that work? Oh, sirens. I forget we're in a city. (laughs) <laughs> this is this is great. So that's like real ambient sound, folks. That's the city city life. I don't get that out. I don't get that out in the country where this I might am. take a while. This is it. We're just going to have them going past. So I think we're good. <laughs> <laughs> where were we? Okay. So we were saying moving around. Um, yeah. So you did a lot of moving around for your career. Yeah. Well, really, it was university because when you train to be in well. Originally, I went to music college as a violinist. Oh. Um, did a couple of years as a violinist. Okay. And then decided that I wanted to be a singer. Okay. <laughs> as you do. As one does <laughs> after years of expensive musical instruments yeah. and tuition. <laughs> okay. Um, so then I took a little bit of time between uh, to decide exactly what I wanted to do and went to Manchester, to the music college in Manchester. Did five years there. Then went to Glasgow and did the opera school in Glasgow. Right. We thought that we were going to stay in Glasgow. Then I I got pregnant and we decided that actually we were going to move back to our home town to be closer to family. Yeah. Uh, good thinking at good this thinking point. Good thinking at this point. Uh, <laughs> Then moved to Germany. All right. So <laughs> nowhere near family, the family. As far away from family <laughs> as possible. Okay, so that's that's interesting. So that what was the reason for the move to Germany then in the end? In the end it was because Ben got work here in Germany. So Ben's your husband. Yes. Yeah. Um before we did the move to Nuremberg, we went to Berlin. Mm-hmm. When you're in music college in England, it's Relatively well known that there are much, the many more opportunities in Germany for oh, really? work as an opera singer. Really? Yeah. In Britain, there's only four full time opera houses. Okay. So you've got two opera houses in London, one in Wales, and yeah. one in Leeds. Okay. So it's not it's not a lot. Of op- not a lot of options. No, it's not a lot of options. There's a lot of people training. Right. There's a lot of people that come from abroad. Mm-hmm. It's a pretty small island. Yeah. So, so it's tough to get into those. Tough. And Germany's always been very well known because, you know, every town has its opera house. Yeah. So you're going to be, you know. I assumed it was like that in the UK. I yeah. don't know why I just, it just yeah. assumed that. No, not at all. No, there's there's very little opportunity for, there's part-time opera houses as well. Like yeah. Scottish opera. Yeah. Well, Welsh National Opera, they are full-time. They tour a lot. Opera North tours a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, so we thought we'd try our hand in Germany. Yeah. What we thought we were going to do, we so we went to Berlin and stayed there for two, three months and did loads of agents, auditions. And in that time, Ben did an audition here in Nuremberg and got the job. Okay. And these kinds of jobs are really, really hard to find. Okay. It's full-time employment. Mm. As a singer. Jo- yeah, as a singer, full time employment, it's kind of like secure dream, job. It's, it? it really is. It's it's fantastic. Yeah. Um, so we couldn't we couldn't miss no. that opportunity. No. Uh, so that spurred the move to Nuremberg. So that's seven and a half years ago. Is 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 Ben still employed at the same place that he moved here for in that same yeah. job? Okay, yeah. so it has really been a oh yeah a long long term thing. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So what does that mean? Regular. Uh, of Twitter, regular performances, or how does that work? In a normal season, not oh, like. No, right. <laughs> in, right. A, in a normal season, yeah. I mean, it's not an easy life because you've got every week is different. Mm. So he gets, in a week, he gets a day and a half off. Okay. Uh, rehearsals are in the mornings and the, in the evenings. Mm. 
Mm. So afternoons are free. So for him, for a work week, it's very difficult for us to plan anything. Yeah, sure. You know, it's yeah. it's not like a nine to five job. Yeah, um, which is kind of cool in a way, but it's also very difficult to plan around. That. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> particularly when you've got family life as yes. well, and, <laughs> and then your daughter starts getting older, and yeah. they start getting more things that they're going to be doing. Oh, yes. and, oh yeah. Yeah, yeah. How old is your daughter now? She's nine. Okay. So, so yeah, she's... getting to that age where they need to be carted around for this practice. Oh, and this yeah. practice. Is she doing any kinds of music? <laughs> she's learning the French horn. Okay, so oh, yeah. obviously. Yeah. Like with this yeah. kind of genetic <laughs> stock kid, you better learn a musical yeah, yeah. instrument. Yeah. I'm sure our neighbours love us. <laughs> <laughs> As is grim. <laughs> you practice that French horn. Um, Not in the Metag's row, though. <laughs> oh, yeah. What, what time is Metag's row? It's from like 12. One till three here. One till three? Okay, yeah. by me. With, yeah. From me, it starts at 12, I think, and goes till about three. I think it's about three yeah. hours out in the country. Yeah. Yeah, you can't mow lawn or practice the French horn, apparently. No, or singing, as I found when I oh, first moved here. Really? <laughs> yeah. So you were practicing here and then you, yeah. in the in the Mittags. Oh, yeah. The, the, so just to explain for people who maybe don't know that, who don't live in Germany, because if you live in Germany, you know that. Uh, it's it's a period of the day where you're supposed to be quiet. There's no not supposed mm -hmm. to be any sounds. Yeah, and, and uh, I didn't know about and it. And there's this person when... practicing opera. <laughs> well, because when we first moved out here, Ben started work more or less straight away. Yeah. And Agatha at the time was two when we moved here. Okay. So I spent a lot of time just with her, yeah. just doing stuff. Yeah. So afternoons when Ben was free, of course, was my time when I could do my work. Yeah. So he came home at one o'clock and then two o'clock I could start doing some work for myself. He'd take yeah. Agatha out of the house. Mm. And, uh, yeah. Did someone complain? Oh, yeah. Really? I got a knock on the door. Oh, yeah. Like after the first day or had, had this gone I on think a few this days? had probably gone on a, a couple of weeks or something. So long something. enough for the Germans to say, we can't, <laughs> we can't take it. This. Even, <laughs> even though I'm not doubting the quality of your uh, opera singer, but I know how the Germans are as well. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But, you know, it's not beautiful when you're practicing singing. No. Because you, you, you don't start from the start of this aria yeah. and go all the way through the end. <laughs> it's not like they're getting a free performance. No. They're getting a little you, snipper you that's repeated. You get like this one bar that we just can't sing right. <laughs> And you keep singing it over and over again. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's that's kind of a nightmare situation. I should imagine for people because I was I was thinking, well, there are worse things you could hear in the Mittag's Ruhr site than opera singing. If if I heard opera singing, I'd be like, oh, that's love. That's but it, but yes, practicing is different. Practicing yeah, is completely not the same different. As actual performance. Yeah, yeah. And I remember <laughs> I got on Facebook after I'd had this. Incident with my neighbour. So tell me about the incident first before you go there. <laughs> so I got a knock on the door and I thought, oh, heck, I'll go, I'll go to the door. And it was our neighbour from downstairs. She, she's not here anymore. And she's like, you have got to stop singing. I cannot take it anymore. <laughs> you know, she's at the end of her tether. Yeah. Like for her to be in, at your door knocking, she's like, this, just stop. <laughs> Just <laughs> me completely misunderstanding this situation. I was like, but I can't. <laughs> <laughs> it's the only time I have to practice. Of course, of course. <laughs> so I was completely that really irritating but, <laughs> England girl, English girl that's like, no, no, I'm not gonna because you didn't <laughs> no. know about the because I didn't know about the mitags rule the, about the, about this this time where we're not meant to make you were like, any noise. Then, you know what? I'm gonna take my stand. I'm gonna stand up for myself <laughs> and no German. Yeah, well, and you have no right. Well, turns <laughs> out they do actually. have a right. <laughs> <laughs> so then, what happened? So then I got onto Facebook and I was just like, oh no, this is a nightmare. I don't know how I'm going to deal with this yeah. if the neighbours. Because obviously when you fill in your contract with the landlord, you you, you say, they ask, you know, yeah. are you going to make any noise or is yeah. there going to be anything particularly? And we told them that we're both opera singers. <laughs> we're just we're assumed expected. that it's going to be fine. Yeah, like we have to practice people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. And yeah, then a friend of mine who's lived in Berlin for a really long time, she's like, were you singing in the Metagsruhe? And I was like, like, the what? what? Say what? Yeah. <laughs> she's like... Look in your contract and see if there's a is if there's a series in the day where you've got to just be yeah. quiet. And there was. And there it was. 
So how did that feel? You must have been pretty heartbroken because was that was your well, that is your time to sing. That's your yeah. Only time. I mean, we just just meant that we had to reorganise our afternoons a little bit so that yeah. I could actually get some work done. Um, and I was a little mortified and kind of ran past her door every time. I was like, "Please don't come out!" Don't come out. Like don't hiding come behind out. things until she disappears. <laughs> like, okay, it's safe to come out. Ah, oh, God, yeah, that is um, that's kind of awkward. That is yeah. that is difficult. But so you were. Um, so Ben had a job. Did you have a job right away or what were you practicing for? Were you just practicing? Yeah, no, I didn't have a job when I first moved out here. Um, we took the decision that I would take a step back from searching for work. Cause obviously when you move here with a two year old, yeah. they have needs. Yeah. There's, there's, they're at a particularly demanding phase. They are absolutely. And you know, I mean, we didn't have a kindergarten place. Mm. <laughs> there was no kinder cripper or anything that we could use. Because you've um, just arrived. We just arrived. We have no family here. Mm-hmm. So it was my job to stay yeah. at home and yeah. look after yeah. Agatha. So, yeah, it was it was pretty tough, actually, yeah. when we first got here. Yeah. yeah. It, 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 difficult times? Very difficult times. What, what yeah. was difficult? Other than angry neighbours showing up at your door <laughs> asking you to stop singing. <laughs> I found it very, very difficult to integrate, really. Because I was at home a lot. Yeah. I had learned some German when I was back in England, because obviously when you're studying to be an opera singer, you learn languages as part of your courses. Okay. But what we learned more than anything was how to pronounce. Mm-hmm. So we spent a lot of time being able Pronounce. to sound like we actually <laughs> come from the country without having a clue really what right. we were speaking. Right. And I'd studied German at school as well. But of course, when you study it at school, mm-hmm. it's basically sentences that you learn. Yeah. And yeah. you learn how to write postcards. Yeah. Which is brilliant, except I mean, when you great. move to the country. <laughs> yeah. Well, you can send your family a lot of postcards, but they can't yeah, read the they German. They can't read the so. German. <laughs> <laughs> so we confused a lot of people when we first moved here, because of course, whatever we could say, we could say it really well, relatively accent free. <laughs> But then we wouldn't get any further in the conversation. Yeah. So people, people would immediately think you were pretty good at German. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And then they'd, they'd say something and be like, what? So, Sorry. Uh, that's... Uh, no, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Then they'd look at you a little strange. As the Germans do, that little scrunched yeah. up look. <laughs> and, yeah. What? And we'd be like, I'm really sorry. I can't say anymore. <laughs> do right. you speak any English? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Which is not conducive to settling, no. really. No. You know, it, it's... It's very, very difficult to have a conversation with anybody, even when you've got a two-year-old running around your feet. Um, so I tried to go to like the baby parks that, mm-hmm. that they have. I was so exhausted from it, though, because I just couldn't interact with people. Yeah. So you would go down there. So I'd go there and sit there. <laughs> and just watch a two-year-old <laughs> clamor around. just watch a two-year-old and many other two-year-olds <laughs> terror around the place. <laughs> With lots of people trying to talk to me and, okay. and trying to help yeah. me interact. Yeah. And I was yeah. like, I really, can't. I can't. I really want to tell you these things, but it's nearly impossible. Yeah. And no one spoke no one spoke English. No, they didn't actually yeah. at, the, at this. So that wasn't very helpful. No. No. <laughs> I think that's the danger, or not a danger, but that's, that's a problem with a city like Nuremberg. I think in Berlin you would always find... Uh, English people in yeah. Munich and Hamburg. There's like wherever you end up living, you're going to be surrounded by some people who can speak very good yeah. English. Uh, whereas Nuremberg is, there are areas in the city itself where the people mm-hmm. in the shops speak English and there's a lot of English people around. But when you yeah. get to the residential areas and 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 so on, and it's a bit yeah. And of course, things like the English Stammtisch, where people will meet and they'll go and be able to chat in English and chat in German to each other. Yeah. Um, I couldn't do because. Ben's working in the theatre, oh, right, so yeah. his evenings, mm-hmm. he's at work, mm-hmm. so I'm at home. That is tricky. It was super tricky. That is tricky. Yeah. And it, I mean, eventually, of course, we've integrated, you know, we're seven yeah. and a half years down the, the line. And yeah, it has to happen sometime. Yeah, we found our way. <laughs> but <laughs> what course, was it? What do you think it was? What was the, what helped you integrate in the end? Did things, is it a case that things slowly and gradually got better and you understood the language more or was there a pivotal moment where you made some good friends or something well actually our neighbor that doesn't live here anymore they lived upstairs they had kids mm-hmm. and one day we were walking down the down the stairs and they said does your daughter need a place in a kindergarten okay and I'm like 
Yes. yes, what do you know? <laughs> yes, she really does. <laughs> um, and they they were in a kindergarten. So okay. this is obviously, this is a slightly different experience than being in a normal kindergarten. What's the difference? What is a um, kindergarten? So a kindergarten is a smaller um, smaller place. Uh, at this one, there was about 18, 20 children all together. Okay. Um, and it's called Elton Initiative. So it means that, the parents themselves are a lot more involved. Okay. So we went and cooked for the children mm. and we were we formed committees. So for the committee for the parties and the festivals and for the renovations in the in the actual building itself. So we had a lot of meetings all together. Mm. Mm. The first one I went to was terrifying. <laughs> <laughs> we arrived and the first thing that they decided to do was do a, um, a get to know each other game. Okay. Where we all were assigned an animal with a post it okay. note stuck on our forehead. And we all had to guess what we were by asking questions. Okay. Here's me with my terrible German, Trying not actually knowing any animal. <laughs> <laughs> like even, I'm not going to be able to guess those people. <laughs> <laughs> and we're all mingling around in the room with these post-it notes stuck on our heads. And they're all German, right? And they're all German, well, mostly German. <clears throat> and, and I had to ask these questions. And I was like, I don't know what to ask. <laughs> so that was my first initiation into yeah. the kindergarten, into kinderladen yeah. Yeah. lifestyle. And, you know, it, it, it remains so crazy. But it's, for us, it was a lifesaver because it's like a family. Yeah. I've I've heard of something. So I didn't realize they were called kindergarten, but I've heard of those uh, sort of kindergarten type places where the parents do pretty much everything. Everything is yeah. handled by the parents, and that's yeah. that's in a way. I mean, I can think of nothing worse. Like when I think about it, like I don't <laughs> want to do any of that stuff. I want other people taking care of that. But I suppose for in in terms of integration, it's a great thing because yeah. you're forced to uh, to interact and and people have, have to talk to you as well. <laughs> and they were superb. I mean. The, the staff, um, some of them could speak a little bit of English. So, of course, when we took Agatha for the first time, mm. we'd, we'd taught her a little bit of German and, right. and we'd made sure that she'd been listening to German cartoons and things mm. on the telly before she went yeah. um, so that she at least had an ear that, that there was a different language because she spoke relatively early and she had a lot of English already that she was saying yeah. by the time she went. But they were able to interact with her a little bit in English yeah. when they really couldn't help her to understand what they were trying to ask her to do in German. Mm -hmm. So her German came on so quickly. Yeah. It was incredible. So how old was she at that time? So speak? she was two and a half when two she started. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, it was utterly hilarious for, for quite some time because she just had a complete mixture of German yeah. and English. But we didn't say anything to her. We just let her talk and talk sure. and talk. Yeah. And yeah, so these wonderful Denglish, German English sentences used to come out. But eventually she said to us one day, she asked whether it was a German word or whether it was an English word. And this went on for kind of a day or two. Okay. And then all of a sudden the two languages just split. So she was just figuring out like, okay, yeah. this is this, this is, is the German. one language, this is another this language. Is and then it just was yeah. amazing how kids can do it's that. It's just incredible. Yeah. And so obviously for us, I mean, language wise, it was hard work. And of course... With a kindergarten, it also means that you have to, if any of the staff members are sick, mm -hmm. you provide help right. for them in that day. So you go in and help out in the kindergarten. You basically just be there to provide support to the teaching staff, that the, right. to the to the teachers, and not really to the it's here. Here and, what do you call that? The care the caregivers, the care, I guess. Yeah, yeah. But even that doesn't yeah, it cover doesn't, it, does it? It just doesn't know. No. No. I don't even, what do they call that in English? Does it have I don't know what we would call that in English. The the nursery assistant. Maybe. I don't know. Yeah. But you're right. That's it's, it. it's, I have to look that up. It's <laughs> it's that up. <laughs> it's here. That's it. Um and unfortunately at the time one of the teachers was very sick. So we've been in the kindergarten, kindergarten, what, two, three months? And all of a sudden we were faced with going in oh God. and with 18 <laughs> small children with not very much German. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> dealing with, with that. Uh, dealing with that. And I, I, I very quickly realised that if I read stories, it was all fine. Okay. <laughs> Until they got questions. <laughs> oh, God. No <laughs> questions today, no kids. No questions. Sorry. Just listen, listen to, to the, the story. story. <laughs> 
You can make up your own mind about the answers. <laughs> so yeah, it was a, all really a bit of baptism of fire, I'd yeah, say. Yeah. The, the... <laughs> yeah, but it's a, it's a. Um, was there any doubt in your mind when you got so your neighbours came to you and said, "There's this kindergarten that's got a place open for a kid and that you could join us." Was there any moment where you learned how they do things there that you thought we can't do that? Well, I think we were just terrified full stop okay. <laughs> when we moved out here. It so was, it didn't matter. I mean, we were thrown into a, a, a crazy situation, yeah. really. I mean, Ben yeah. was thrown into working full time in an opera house that that worked in German. Yeah. Um, his first day at work was going on stage. Wow. You know, it's like, <laughs> right. so you do these crazy things as opera singers and, you know, we're pretty good at acting, so we can... We can hide it a little bit yeah. if we're feeling yeah. particularly nervous about stuff. But I think because we already knew people that, you know, we'd made friends with our neighbours and we'd met a couple of the other families that mm -hmm. were at the, at the kindergarten as well. And Agatha seemed to get on very, very well with the other kids. Okay. So I think it was just it was just that happenstance yeah. that, that we were just, it, it was just luck, pure yeah. luck, I think, that... We have found this apartment, and we happen to have friends who were able to bring us for the for the kindergarten. Yeah. And because who knows what have would I mean? Maybe you would have still have integrated through a different route, or it might have taken longer. Yeah. But, but it would probably have been more difficult at a normal kindergarten because I think you so. might still have been isolated from other yeah. parents. Yeah, and I would I would definitely recommend it to anybody that's going to be moving to yeah. Germany with small children to look into it. Because it's not something that you'd necessarily know about unless you mm -hmm. actually meet somebody that's got a child yeah. who's at least kindergarten. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't know. Like I said, I'd heard the concept, but I didn't know it's called a kindergarten, and I didn't know that they're yeah. that pre uh, prevalent. Um, yeah, I avoid. I mean, I don't avoid. I do them, but I don't like those Elton Arbans and things like that at the <laughs> kindergarten. For the very now, it's better that my German is finally at a point where I'm. I'm not worrying about my German when I'm talking to people anymore. I'm finally at that point where I can just like not be focusing on the grammar and the thing. But before that, I would detest those evenings because it was just such a strain. Like, I don't think Germans understand how it, it is for a two hour Elton album, making conversation with people. Oh. You're doing a German and it's like other parents and you've <laughs> got a lot of pressure on yourself to make friends with people. It's tiring. You get home and you're exhausted. Absolutely exhausted. And of course, that's thousandfold as well, because you're doing this all day, every day, yeah. when you, you, any interaction that you have with anybody, Anything. you, you've got to concentrate so yeah. hard. Yeah. I remember one of our first Elton Arbans that we went to and they discussed something for a really, really long time. And, you know, we were trying to keep up, yeah. we, we kind of lost our way a little yeah, sure. bit in it and we were like, what's going on now? Now just nod and smile. And then all of a sudden they said something and everybody's hands went up <laughs> Like, guess we're putting our hands up what's, what's going on now <laughs> and because we didn't know the vocabulary that we were going to vote on what yeah. we've just been discussing who is against <laughs> and who is for this and of course then everybody turned to look at us because we'd not put our hands up yeah so does like, that mean you're against it or are you for it like what <laughs> so like, hand up it's like and then somebody tried to explain to us oh, yeah. why we should be putting our hand up and we didn't understand that explanation oh, either <laughs> <laughs> but it is it uh, every little interaction can be like that yeah. right it's, yeah yeah i remember telling my wife in the early days that uh everything is a mission when you when you uh, mm -hmm. when we were first arrived in germany everything just a simple thing of going to the store or going to the bank or anything it's just a mission everything's yeah, a yeah. mission <laughs> opening your post opening your post <laughs> opening your post I've got 10 pages and I don't understand <laughs> don't know what the they first mean. sentence. <laughs> oh, God. Um, but you're but you're beyond that now. You're, is your German yeah. better now? Yeah. I took an integrations course mm -hmm. um, because I felt, because I was spending so much time at home by myself and not really in, conversing with people, I felt that my German was really suffering for it. Right. Ben obviously being full time in the theatre was having conversations all the time and I could see that his vocabulary was improving. Mm. He was able to just chat with people so much more. So we decided that it would be good for me to do the integrations course. Yeah. Which in itself was superb, but because I already had some German, it was not brilliant for me because I started at Bit Eins. So I started okay. what that's the third section. Yeah, it, so it's A1, right. A2, and then B1. Then B1. Yeah. 
So what I really needed to fix was my grammar, Mm -hmm. which is in the A1 and the A2 course. But because I'd already passed the test for that, I was put into the B1 course. (laughs) Which assumes a certain level of Of grammatic proficiency. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, Yeah, I don't. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. But it, in some ways, it doesn't matter. The profession that I'm in, most people are relatively forgiving and I don't have to sit down and compose mm. business letters yeah. or anything like that. Yeah. It's not a complete disaster that my grammar <laughs> is really awful. Yeah. But I can yeah. converse with people now. That my vocabulary is much better. And, and I think that's the most important thing. Like, that's, yeah. the Grammar can come later. I, it depends. Some people need to learn the grammar to learn the language. But yeah. um, for me, it happened kind of organically altogether. It's just... You yeah. Gotta just take it. Yeah. Like. Okay. So, but let's just talk about. You mentioned your career. Uh, what 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 is your c- career path here in German Germany been? Are you an opera singer now by trade, or are you doing something else? Um. Well, no. I'm I'm still on the opera path. Hopefully. <clears throat> um. What I have found is that to get on the stage, you need an agent. Okay. So I've spent a lot of time doing a lot of auditions. Um. And just before we went into lockdown, I have a couple of agents' auditions and they were both very interested oh. in <laughs> in representing me for theatre auditions and some contracts were beginning to come in. And, and then, then it's lockdown just, it's happened. like the worst timing. <laughs> the worst timing ever. Yes. Um, so you're starting back from square one when you... When a little bit, yeah. yeah. But I... I think with the lockdown, the the whole business of being in opera and theatre mm. is changing anyway. Okay, you have to be a little bit more proactive now um, because at the moment the big productions can't go the same yeah. way. Yeah. Um, but in a way, I think for freelancers, it's given great opportunities. Okay. With some of my friends, we um, they set up a an online concert series. Mm. We did a wonderful concert of medieval madrigals. Fantastic. And and I really, really hope that that's going to continue because okay. it was a superb series that they got going. And yeah. I think there's quite a few of these ideas out there and we've just got to get them out to people, yeah. you know, because this is, a, this is another option. Mm. Because I don't think people can live without music and theatre. No, they can't. It's it's, just, it's a it's a big thing to to not have, yeah. Especially when you need it the most. I mean, yeah, that's the irony of the, this whole coronavirus thing. Is this is when you need uh, the arts. Yeah, dare I say, also sports as well. I mean, people yeah. need sports. It's it's all distractions and things to 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 use as an escape. So yeah, it's, yeah it is absolutely. kind of hard. It is. It's really really difficult. I mean, you notice it so much from it. it there's just just things that are missing. Yeah. That, that those moments of. The exhilaration of going to a massive rock concert yeah. or anything, yeah. you know, it's like, where has that gone? <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. I, that's one of the things I miss most is the the rock concerts as well. Mm-hmm. I see you wearing a full beat shirt. Yeah. And I've seen on your social media that you're a quite the full beat fan. <laughs> uh, they're a, what, they're, are they Danish? Yeah. They're Danish. They're yeah. a Danish band. They're really cool. I like they them. They are all. awesome. Yeah. Um, during, so during the early times uh, where, where things were frustrating and uh, kind of when you were getting started with the kindergarten, was there any time that you guys thought, screw it, we're going back, we, we can't do this, it's too much effort? Mm, no, I don't think so. Mm. Um, we had we had a really difficult time really in our second year of being here. Um, it was kind of a bit of a roller coaster really. Agatha got really sick. She okay. got she got pneumonia and had eight nights in the hospital. Oh wow! Which in itself that's terrifying. <laughs> yeah. There's there's nothing much worse than than not really speaking the language, yeah. having to be in a hospital, not really understand what's going it's, on with yeah. your very very small child, and they're saying no, she's got to be admitted. Yeah. We've got all these tests to do. She needs to go on oxygen. There's a oh beeping machine. Um. So. Yeah, that was that was really quite a tough time. Yeah. Uh, she she recovered very well from it and was fine. I think it's what is tough and what we still find tough is not being close to family. Mm-hmm. It's hard, and it's hard that I know that we took Agatha away from the rest of her family. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's what I 
battle with more than anything, I think, because we have an amazing life here. We've got a great apartment. We live in a wonderful city. We have all these amenities. The outdoor life that we have compared to what we would have in Britain, I think is quite different. Okay. We spend a lot of time at the Freibad, so outdoor pool yeah. over the summer months. We wouldn't have that back in England. But the knowledge that Agatha doesn't get to spend time with her cousins, with my parents, with Ben's mum and you know, aunties and uncles. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah. And I that's think the hard thing. It is. It is. And especially during coronavirus now where you've got the added, uh, I don't know how it is for you guys, but you've got the added thing of like, when do we, where, yeah. when will we see them again now? Like yeah. when are we actually, when is my parents going to see their, their grandkids yeah. and so on? It's, Absolutely. It's a, it's a tough time to be away from family yeah. now with coronavirus. It really is. Because yeah. normally over the year we would that my mum and dad would have been over and Ben's mum would have been yeah. over. Um but they've just not yeah. I, my mum's had to be at home all the time anyway because she's she's got lung problems. Okay. So she's risk. So she's a, a risk ca- category. Yeah. Um and normally our summer holidays is going back to England. Mm-hmm. So spending time back in England and seeing everybody we didn't do that this year. Yeah. And that, uh, yeah, that makes the things difficult because that was like a time to rejuvenate and uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, we took we took the time to rejuvenate in a different way. So mm. there's always a positive to find in it, I think. But yeah, I mean, it's what eight months since we've seen family now, which yeah. for us is a really long time. I know right. for some people that's quite normal. You know, people have moved away much further than than we have from family. So yeah. you know, they don't see people the same. Um, but for us, it's not our reality. Yeah. We, we have the situation where our, our, our families are all in South Africa. And that's mm-hmm. something that I, I envy a bit about Germans because when they have rough times, when someone gets sick or like I ended up in hospital recently to, for, for emergency surgery that I didn't know would, would happen. And it, was, it wasn't bad. It was pretty tame. But I was in hospital for two nights and then I was completely incapac- incapacitated. I couldn't do anything when I got back for at least a week. Like I was literally just told to lie down and not move around too much, mm-hmm. which was fantastic, by the way. But the thing is, <laughs> my wife had to do everything on her own. So she had to organize the three kids and mm-hmm. deal with uh, the normal everyday life. That's when the Germans would have Oma or, or Opa around to yeah. deal with that kind of thing. And that's the kind of, that's what I, like you, I also miss that kind of just someone to help and also that the kids get to see the grandparents. Yeah. Yeah. Because they, they need that interaction. It's, you know, and you, you, you know yourself when they finally have that interaction, we can relax a little bit because Mm. we're not constantly on, so to speak, being absolutely the person that's responsible for this child. We also get that break, Yeah, you know, um, because you don't get time to be a couple either yeah. Yeah, in no. this situation, yeah. I find. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's tough, mm-hmm. I think. That's one that's one reality that I don't think is talked about enough that's about true. when you when you move to a different country. That actually, you know, your priorities are being the family, um, but you need there's a reason that we're together as well as yeah. a as a couple. Yeah. And you need that that actual adult couple yes you do time to to go and i don't know even just to walk around the city together yeah. and it's very 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 difficult i find to find that yeah. when you've got no other family around in yeah. the area yeah you i think it's difficult even if you're living at home or in your home country with a with your family around to, to and you've got a small kid to make time for yourselves as a couple but it's even more difficult when you're living far away from family and mm-hmm. the kids is always with you yeah, the kid, it has yeah. to be because there's, who's going to take it? Yeah, Except yeah. if uh, they go to kindergarten or something, then it's different. But then yeah. usually the parents are working or <laughs> yeah. whatever. So it is. That's a, that's quite an interesting point and, and not something I've thought of before. Is is the, the toll that it can take on on the family relationship and on, on the couple relationship as well? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. It means it means you have to work a little harder to find those moments. Mm-hmm. I think where you can just say okay, this is our time. Yeah. This is the time that we have together. Yeah. I mean, we've kind of turned it around a little bit now that, because obviously with Ben working in the evenings, we tend to go and meet each other for lunch. Right. So, you know, where you would go out in the evening, go and have dinner together. Yeah. But, you know, we'll, I'll just say, well, look, I'll come and meet you after work. We'll go yeah. and have lunch together somewhere. That's cool. And so, as I said before, there's always a positive that you can find out of these, yeah. out of these situations. But 
sometimes it takes a little bit of thinking <laughs> going, oh. Yeah. So speaking of uh, the UK, <laughs> now something I don't like to do on this podcast is we're like, I don't like to use people as spokespeople for their country. So if I have an American on, I don't like to ask them about Donald Trump. And I, if I have whatever, I don't usually. But in this case, I've had a few people ask me to interview people mm -hmm. about from the UK about the, inf the effect that Brexit has had. Mm -hmm. So because you're from the UK, I'm going to have to ask you this question. <laughs> <laughs> and I think someone was, I can't remember who it was posted on the Facebook group. I don't know if you remember seeing, I think you're also in the Facebook group. Someone mm -hmm. asked something about, uh, could you, could, could I please interview someone about Brexit? So I'm not going to interview about Brexit, but maybe, um, I found an article that I, uh, that I also shared with you. It's, it was from the Guardian. The headline in this Guardian article is the number of UK citizens emigrating to EU has risen by 30% 30, 30 since Brexit vote. So that's a lot of people deciding to move to Europe. And I think a lot of people are moving to Germany as well. Um, so what effect has Brexit had on you personally as a, a, a UK citizen? Well, we are now dual citizens. Mm -hmm. So we took on dual citizenship. Uh, we thought really long and hard about it. Um, we were very, very lucky that we could fit it in in the time we'd been here long enough to be able to apply for dual citizenship okay. because next year you have to give up your British citizenship. Oh, really? Yeah. You'll only be able to change to German citizenship, okay. yeah, you, you, which we didn't want to do because we want to, we're British. That's our, that's who we are. Um, and we didn't want to feel that we couldn't return yeah. if we wanted to. Yeah. I think that's always been the the major thing for us is that if it really does get too much, we can always go back. And in that that respect, I think it makes it easier here yeah. for us. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, so I think we made the decision earlier than we would have done to get citizenship here in Germany as well. Right. But for musicians, for opera singers... So many of my friends, this mm. is a nightmare situation yeah. for them because yeah. they're freelancers right. and they've been able to work anywhere in Europe. You can go and audition anywhere in Europe yeah. and it's not a problem. But now, I mean, it's basically closed those doors to them. Yeah. And as I said before, there's very little opportunity in Britain, really. That's, that's also another aspect of this I didn't think about, the the effect on things like the arts yeah. and people yeah. studying yeah. this kind of career. Well, and, and it's the uncertainty of it all as well because yeah. obviously... Nobody can tell us what the situation is going to be. And we sat down and talked about it a lot because obviously for me, I've gone, I've gone to Austria and gone and auditioned. As I said, there was an agent interested in me and he is based not in Germany. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> so that, that experience would be close to me once Brexit. You would just not have it. You know, I, I, yeah. I don't know whether I would have it or not. I don't know whether anybody sure. that is going to be in Germany will have the um, right of free movement that we currently have as European citizens yeah. and it makes it, yeah. So I was, I found it really difficult thing to deal with. And, and for a really long time, I was feeling very, very stressed about it because I just didn't know whether I would only be able to work in Germany and therefore audition in Germany. And of course, situations come up where if you've already sung a role in one place, mm. then you can be rung up from a theater saying, our singer's sick. Can you right. jump in? Yeah. And, you know, then you can go and jump in. And if that happened to be across a border somewhere, then I don't know whether that would be open yeah. to me or not. Yeah. So this was one of our big reasons for for getting the dual citizenship and just just to know that our current situation remains as it is because we have a daughter who's been in the German school system for mm -hmm. all this time. Mm -hmm. She's fourth year. She's in her last year of Grundschule now. She's German by all accounts. Yeah. You know, That's she's, the culture she's grown up in yeah. with the kids around her. And yeah. Yeah. I mean, is she cult. also dual citizenship? Yes. Okay. Yeah. That, see, that's the great thing. I think that's, that offers the maximum amount of, uh, like you said, it's all about having options, I think, and possibilities later on. So if you need to go back, you can go back. If you need to somehow stay through Europe. Mm -hmm. So it's really a win-win situation. But uh, yeah. like you said, for a lot of people, that's not going to be the case. No, it really isn't. And, and, the uncertainty of it is is very hard to deal with. I mm -hmm. mean, mm -hmm. we have found our stress levels rather high in the last couple of years, really. Just I'm sure. 
just trying to decide whether it's a good idea to because if you take on dual citizenship then it, it's changed us as as people because mm. we're not only are we british we're german You're as german, well yeah. and we take on obviously the responsibilities that that is yeah. you know we, we've taken on the responsibility of being a german citizen yeah and you can't take that as a light no decision no, you agree. can't just go you know what i think i'm just going to make i'm just going to be german today yeah. you know it's, <laughs> no. it's not it's not how it works yeah. Yeah. so yeah and mm. i'm not surprised that people are moving into europe like you said, have, this is, like I said, I mean, yeah. this is a lot. It's a, what, it, what was it, 30% um, rise in the number of UK citizens. The study also shows a 500% increase in those who made the move and then took up citizenship in EU state. That's you, Fiona. That's me. That's I'm you. one of those. They're, talking, they're, like, they're pretty much writing your name here. <laughs> Germany saw a 2,000% rise with 31,600 Britons naturalizing there since the referendum. 31,600 Britons naturalizing. Wow. Since the referendum, that is a lot of people. It doesn't it sound really like a lot of people, is. but 31,600 yeah. people said that they were going to naturalize or become German citizens since the referendum. I mean, that's just unprecedented. So I assume that a lot of them are doing the same thing that you guys did yeah. with the dual citizenship, but that's not going to be an option for forever, as you know. No, no, as you if said. You, I think it's if you're in Germany before the end of this year, then you are going to be given the rights granted to you yeah. that you currently have to live in this country but what is extended around that yeah Yeah. it's anybody's guess at the moment and it's like it says here it says uh while the withdrawal agreement signed in january enshrines the residency work and social rights of eu citizens in the uk and brightens in the rest of the bloc it failed to guarantee the free movement rights of british migrants restricting future employment and residency prospects in other member states i mean that's it's insane. Yeah. It's insane. And I know a lot of people from the UK, a lot of ex-colleagues um, who have been, the one the one guy I know, he's been here for, I think, 30 years or something. Mm-hmm. And he's never taken on a German citizen. And he's only mm. now started saying, no, I now I need to be a German citizen. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, it's quite something. Yeah. So that is interesting. So it, it's definitely had an impact on your guys' lives. Yeah, I think so. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I, positive as well. I mean. Yeah. It, we we are now safe here. We know that our lives can continue in the way that we're used to now. Mm. Um, and Agatha has no problems. She's a German citizen as well as a British citizen. Yeah. Uh, if she wants to continue living here in Germany once she's an adult, she has absolutely that right to do. She can go back to Britain as well if, if yeah. that's what she wants to yeah. do. Yeah. At the end of my interviews I, you you listen to the podcast right so you know <laughs> you know what i ask at the end of the part what advice do you have for foreigners <laughs> i mean you've already given some great ideas uh, some great uh, advice up until now just in the normal conversation but what advice do you have to give uh, i would say always remain flexible mm-hmm. with your thoughts don't don't listen to stereotypes because you'll probably find that the pretty much not true Mm -hmm. um and things may not go the way that you're expecting them to but it's not the end of the world there is always a path forward from where you are yeah and learn how to drive through the roadworks (laughs) on the motorway (laughs) yes i think you're directing this me i feel so i feel kind of attacked now because (laughs) i told you on the way here there were so many roadworks that i took a wrong (laughs) off-ramp So but, I think you're but, telling me. It, no, no. It's it's honestly it's yeah. my it's my absolute nightmare. I used to love driving in Britain. I hate driving yeah. in Germany. But everywhere is a road. Every there's everywhere. Everywhere is roadworks. But everywhere. there's there's so many yeah. cones and markers yeah. that you cannot see the yes. actual no. way no. to go. Well, that's what happened to me today. Yeah, yeah. And I then just you just knew. it's just oh oh wow yeah it's it, that is my big culture shock for Germany Ro- was the, the roadworks. Just, just the outdoor barn, full stop. Yeah. Nothing to do with this, the lack of speed limit. That's great. 
you just yeah. yeah. Get when going. when it, when there's a bit of stretch when there's a stretch of road, it's fantastic because then yeah. you can drive. Whatever. Then you but, can drive and 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 watch out for the Geisterfahrer as well. Yeah. I've never but, never in my life heard of so many people driving the wrong way down the I motorway. Know. And they they announce it on the right. So Geisterfahrer, yeah, exactly. Geisterfahrer are the people who ride the wrong way of the of the motorway. And you hear it on the like by and dry or whatever radio Every station. Day. You're, you're driving like um, just talking about the traffic, and then oh by the way, there's also a Geisterfahrer <laughs> on the A3 heading in this direction. And you're like. What have you ever seen one? Have you ever seen them? I haven't. I am no. so grateful that Me I too. haven't. Me too. Because I would. I. I don't know what I would do. And do you know? Well, there's um some. I think they have some uh, rules about what you're supposed to do, like legally, when there's a guy to mm-hmm. So if you see them, that you go all the way to the right hand side uh-huh. and, and no overtaking, no or overtaking, anything. slow down and it, report it when you can stop. It's incredible. I mean, if this <laughs> happens in Britain, it hits the national news because it just. <laughs> Never Doesn't happens. Happen. And my only explanation for it is that getting onto the motorway is just terrifying <laughs> because you have no idea where you're meant to go to get onto the motorway. <laughs> <laughs> you get to a junction and there's two lanes and it just doesn't look like one's going one direction, yeah. one's going... This is my only explanation for the amount of people that drive but the must, wrong way. I think you're right. There must be a reason. There has to be a reason why Germany... Be. And I, I, we need to look at the statistics, uh, Fiona. I think this, before before this episode comes out, I'm going to look this up and research the statistics and see, does Germany actually have a higher rate of Geisterfahrers? Because if it does, Germany, you need to sort something Fix out. <laughs> something is wrong. <laughs> something is wrong. <laughs> What is going on? Um, I think you got a good point. It is kind of terrifying. Like today, I literally didn't know which. Uh, I ended up taking the wrong off ramp, as I as I said. But there were like cones and things there that that were blocking the way, and I couldn't actually see where the where the oh. thing was. And then there were two quick off ramps, and I missed uh-huh. the first one. And I was like, "Was that? Wasn't it?" And then I'm like, "Okay, I'll yeah. take the second one." And then I say, "But in all honesty, I could have been a guy so far at that point." Because yeah, exactly. I was so confused. Because you have no idea whether yeah. you're meant to be coming off at this one, yeah. and you. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and with no lights, and when you're at, when you when you um, at night, when yeah. you're driving at night, yeah. you can't see the road. You can't see anything. <laughs> oh my god! So it's going to happen that you're going to be a guy so far away. Yeah, it is. It's I know, wow. That that would just be <laughs> that would be me just stopping in the middle of the road. Going, <laughs> <laughs> All right. So th- uh, Fiona, thank you so much for the time and uh, talking to me. Yeah. And, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> now. About that Geisterfahrer thing, uh, I, t- I said in the interview that I would look it up uh, at some of the statistics to try and see if Germany is worse than a lot of other countries. It was very difficult to say for sure. But what I did find out is this. By the way, I think we mentioned in the interview, but Geisterfahrer is basically directly translates as ghost driver, and it means someone who is driving the wrong way on a freeway. And as we said in the interview, it does seem like it happens a lot in Germany. I felt like every time I was driving around and listening to the radio, there would be some alert about a Geisterfahrer. Now, the ADAC in Germany uh, has some statistics for 2019. In 2019, there were 1,912 reports of wrong-way drivers on the freeways. And there were 61 accidents caused by this. So now that is not as much as I felt like it was. 1,912 in a whole year. It's not that bad. Still a lot, Germany. Still a lot. So 61 accidents out of those 1,912 incidents, and nine of those accidents were fatal. And here's an interesting stat about that. 70% of wrong-way drivers are male. So I don't know what that means. But yeah, that's, that's the stats. That's the statistic. And what I also mentioned in the interview is that there is set rules of what you're supposed to do if there's a warning about a wrong way driver on the radio. And this is what you're supposed to do. Slow your speed. This is obvious. Turn on your hazard lights, move over to the right-hand lane, and don't overtake anyone. Obviously, don't overtake anyone. I I, I don't see this happening, though, when the, when the reports come on the radio. People just go on as they usually would. No, I, no one moves over to the right-hand lane, and for God's sake, everyone is overtaking everyone all the time. Uh, so yeah, you're not supposed to overtake anyone. Keep your distance from the driver in front of you. If you feel unsure, stop at the next parking place and keep an eye on the safety lane in case you need to swerve there to avoid an oncoming car. And you're supposed to listen to the radio for further messages. So that's what you're supposed to do. And if you are the wrong way driver, turn on your hazard lights immediately. Go to the side of the road if it's safe. Park as close to the barrier as possible. Now, I assume they're t- they're not talking about the middle barrier here. I assume you have to get to the side barrier where it's a little safer. Get out and stand behind the barrier and call the police on 110. Whatever you do, Don't try to turn around. 
So there, if you drive in Germany, this info could save your life. If that's not a value add from a podcast, I don't know what is. Thank you so much for listening this week. If you want to get in touch with me, thegermanyexperience.de forward slash contact or send me a mail at info at thegermanyexperience.de. I would love to hear from you, whatever you want to tell me. Just mail me or get hold of me on social media. I'm on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. All the links are in the show notes as usual. Music in this episode by my band, Tencent Janes, and additional music by Ryan Anderson until the end. I'll talk to you next week. Auf Wiederhören. Wiederhören.